Um, the uh, suite of tools that microbial ecologists have to uh, investigate natural microbial communities has really exploded in the past few years. Uh, we really spent a lot of time in the previous decades in that upper right corner, so, so getting better and better ways to determine what processes were happening and how we can measure the processes and the rates. Um, but now there's this whole suite of other tools, uh, all the metaomics that you can look at genomes and transcripts and, and, and proteins and now metabolites in natural communities. Um, a really nice emergence recently of, of ecologically relevant model organism systems, particularly for marine in, in, in environments, but not just that. And then we've already heard a lot about these really exciting um, single cell approaches that, that are really permeating the fields right now. Um, I'm just going to, well, the idea with all of these, we hope, is, is that there's a synergism. They're all looking at important questions. They're doing so from different perspectives. And so the, the coming challenge is actually putting all of those two together. So I'm going to talk about just one of these methods today uh, that we've been working with for a couple years, which is metatranscriptomics. And I'm going to make a, a sort of a feeble attempt to, to look at how we can better collect these omics data in a way that integrates better with the biogeochemical rate measurements and hopefully eventually um, with predictive models. Um, so uh, our uh, system is um, uh, uh, generally coastal seawater or open ocean seawater. So we, we collect our samples with a filtration step, uh, basically break open the cells, release this pool of community transcripts, and then we sequence them. Um, I'm going to show you data uh, uh, for mostly that we've been using up until this point has been through 454 sequencing, but if I've got time, we've got some um, new um, Illumina sequence data that I just want to show you at the end. Um, so uh, we have this ability now to look into the, the gene transcription patterns in, in natural microbial communities and I'll give you a couple examples of how we've been using those to address questions in ways that we really couldn't do that before. And the first question uh, that we looked at has to do with identifying the, the bioreactive components of dissolved organic matter in seawater. So uh, seawater has literally uh, probably tens of thousands of different compounds present. We don't really even know how many. Uh, these organic compounds come in, in, in our site, which is off the coast of the southeastern U.S. They're coming from uh, terrestrial systems and, and marsh systems, and there's marine sources. And the bacteria plankton are playing a key role in respiring some of those, and then others that are less biologically labile have a longer residence time and a possibility for being stored actually in the marine environment. We'd love to know the details of that process, but we with all of those different compounds, it's really hard. And so one idea we have for metatranscriptomics is, uh, as my graduate student put it, let the bacteria tell us what those biolabile components are of the, of the dissolved organic carbon pool. And so uh, Rachel Pretzky, um, who's a former PhD student, um, we, we generally just collect a bacteria plankton size fraction on a filter, flash freeze that in the field, and then bring it back and um, process it for um, transcript sequencing. Uh, uh, she collected two replicate samples in the site off the coast of Georgia, uh, and they were sequenced at JGI, and so we have about 400,000 and about 300,000 sequences in these two libraries. So uh, we actually ended up uh, doing the analysis on a very small fraction of those sequences because we decided for our particular question, uh, which is basically of this pool of complex organic matter that's outside the cells, which are the ones that are being targeted by these heterotrophic bacteria for transport across the membrane. And so the transcripts that, that are involved uh, in, in the synthesis of, of transporters, organic carbon transporters, should be the ones that would be most informative. So we pulled out of the data set anything that looked like it was annotating as a, a, a transporter or a component of a transporter for, for, um, for a, a, an organic carbon compound. And now I'm, what I'm showing you is the predicted substrates of those um, as a percentage of the total pool. So these are Rachel's two samples, and then across the back here is the uh, annotation for, for different groups of transporters. We're just using COG categories here to define them. And so you can see a, a lot of the transcripts being made in this microbial community uh, are for tr making uh, uh, proteins that transport amino acids of different types, carbohydrates, and then some other uh, categories, polyamines, lipids, nucleotides. Uh, this would be um, dissolved organic um, uh, 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 compatible solutes like uh, DMSP and um, um, 
uh, glycine betaine, and then we found about one in six of those transcripts were involved in, in, in um, transporters that are annotating as being involved in, in probably uh, small organic acids, which is a little bit of a surprise that there was that kind of a signal. Okay, so uh, what we hope what we're looking at is, uh, is information on the types of compounds that are bioreactive or biolabile that are being targeted by these heterotrophic bacteria plankton for transport across the membrane. Uh, there's at least two major concerns that we have. The first one is, is that these annotations are even correct, uh, but that's not something that we can necessarily solve, but it's certainly something that everybody faces. Uh, or, or even if they're mostly correct, if the details are, are actually misleading. And then, of course, the idea that we're even missing entire types of transporters that haven't been identified. Okay. The second issue we had has to do with whether or not these um, genes are, are, are um, constitutively expressed or not. And so in a very dilute environment without a lot of substrates and not a lot of change over time, it's possible that these bacteria plankton are really not regulating these transporter proteins very much. And if that's the case, then this isn't very informative as a bioassay. It's going to look the same no matter what's to eat, essentially. Uh, so that one we were able to uh, take a look at experimentally. Rachel made um, two uh, model DOC pools that, that are um, composed of compounds that we think are fairly important sources of organic matter in the system. She grew up a bunch of coastal phytoplankton and then extracted um, uh, organic carbon from those uh, living cells. That's our phytoplankton-derived DOC. And then uh, we also collected senescing um, spartina. It's a vascular plant that is extremely abundant in the marshes that line the system. And we think that's a major source of organic carbon as well. And then in each case, um, when Rachel collected those first two samples that I talked about, she collected two additional ones. Uh, one of them got phytoplankton-derived DOC added, the other one vascular plant-derived DOC. We bumped up the, the carbon content by about 20%. We waited one hour to allow any types of changes in expression to occur, and then um, continued the processing and the sequencing. So. Um, I'm going to show you the data from these. On uh, These are M uh, versus A plots that we borrowed uh, from microarray analysis. And every one of the dots on these plots is one of those um, transporter uh, categories that we looked at before. It's a pairwise comparison. So anything that's plotting above this dotted line was uh, uh, overrepresented when we added phytoplankton-derived DOC. Anything plotting below was underrepresented in that transcriptome after we added that uh, phytoplankton-derived material. And then anything that's a uh, different symbol, these squares, were, were significantly different between the two treatments. And so we found that of the, um, all of the transporter categories that we looked at, um, about 15% of those were significantly different after we added this new uh, addition of a different type of labile DOC. Uh, for vascular plant DOC, the amount uh, came up to about 16%. Um, so uh, what are they and, and are they, so it, it looks like they're changing their transcription patterns. Is, is it informative? Does it tell us a little bit about what was in those DOC pools? And so that's what's shown in this lower left corner here. We just took the significantly changed transporter categories that were above the line. So these are the things that are overrepresented in the presence of this new added DOC. And that's what's summarized here. Phytoplankton-derived DOC had a big signal from carboxylic acids, again, which kind of matches what we found in the natural community. Uh, amino acids and some carbohydrates and some other compounds that we expect to be part of phytoplankton um, cytoplasm. Uh, vascular plant-derived DOC looked pretty different. The big signal there were transporters for, for getting carbohydrates across the cell membranes, and that's probably exactly um, what we would have expected. Um, I'm just going to show you one more of these plots, I promise. Uh, and, and in this one, I just want to show you the within treatment variability. And so uh, a lot of these omics methods are starting to be used now and actually experimentally where you're manipulating something. It's great to have replication. It's been hard in the past because of the costs involved, but it's really getting a lot better. For this particular study, we were able to eke out of um, JGI a replicate. And, and so what that does is be able to show us and you guys what type of variability in this, this expression pattern we'd see if we actually collected two samples 
uh, in parallel and then process them independently. And um, that's what that same plot looks like for that. And so it, it's, of course, not all the way to a fully uh, replicated um, uh, experimental design that you would like to have and that I think is, is probably right there already now for a lot of us. But it does show you that the, the variability uh, in, within a treatment, in this case, within these two unmanipulated coastal samples, is really pretty low. Okay, so um, we are really interested in trying to make that connection between the omics data and, and understanding processes and rates and maybe even getting to the point where we could predict them. But we keep uh, banging up against something that we're calling the relative data problem, and that is that most of the omics data that be, are being collected, it's true for, for metagenomics and genomics and, and metaproteomics, is, is that it's being collected as in a relative us in, in, a, in relative units. So we, we sequence something from the environment, we can tell how uh, abundant a particular gene or transcript is as a proportion of that total pool that we um, uh, have sampled. So in my example, uh, I collected two one liter water samples uh, off the coast of Georgia. This one was pre-phytoplankton bloom and that one was post-phytoplankton bloom. I want to compare the transcripts in those two. So I do an extraction, I get two sequence libraries from those and now I want to say, okay, I'm particularly interested in that green transcript and I want to know how important it is in those two systems under di different conditions. And so uh, what I can easily do is a relative percent and, and I know that those green transcripts made up 50% of this library library and they should be in here and they made up 25% of this actually transcript pool and they should be 25% in there. So I know that the ratio is two to one in these two samples. Um, the, but there's other ways to quantify these and in some cases way that might inter, uh, integrate better with rate measurements that are, that are actually typically on an absolute sense. And so what if I wanted to ask how many copies per liter are there of that particular transcript that I think is really critical in mediating a, a particular process. And so I can't actually do that calculation. And I can't do it because I don't know what fraction of the original transcript pool that was in that liter of water is represented in my library. And I don't even know if it's the same fraction between the two samples. Um, I set up this cartoon so I can tell you that the answer is if you went and counted those green dots in those two liter samples that the ratio is actually one to one. And so the difference between the relative and the absolute has nothing to do with changes in the absolute numbers of the green transcript of which we're interested in, but actually changes in the other transcripts which we're actually not focusing on. And so both of these, both relative and absolute, give us great data, but they give us very different types of data and it would sure be nice to be able to get both out of these um, omics data sets, particularly the meta-omics data sets. And so one way to do that is to add a, an internal standard. Uh, and so this is work by Scott Gifford, a PhD student in my lab. Uh, we basically just make an artificial message. Uh, we're just uh, doing in vitro transcription from a commercial cloning vector in this particular case. So we, we can run off as many as we want. They're the exact same size. We know the, the um, uh, sequence of them. They're all the same. And so in this experiment, Scott collected a sample again off the southeastern U.S. coast, we take this filter that has the bacteria plankton and flash freeze it and then when he goes uh, to, to start the processing, he's going to add some of this standard um, and then we can follow it through the experiment and see how much of that comes back out in the end in the sequence library. So in this example, he added 4.7 times 10 to the 10th of these, we call them PGEMs, that's the name of the vector that we used. Um, so we know that's how many was in the tube when, when he put them in. Uh, that whole thing gets processed and in the end in the library. He found uh, about 3,993 of those in the library. So that means we sequenced one in every 10 million standards that we added into that tube. So you can do a calculation of the sample sequencing depth and it's really low. 0.000009% of the transcripts in the original sample that was filtered actually got sequenced in that library. Um, we can use the ratio backwards along with those uh, 3,000 artificial uh, messages. We found about half a million real messages and so that must have meant that in that, on that filter that we originally collected from a one liter sample, there must have been about one trillion uh, bacterial messenger RNA. Um, this is not meant to discourage you in any way. Um, you, you could tell, you could count, get a very good estimate of how many 
cells there are in the ocean without counting every drop of water. Uh, and, and, and likewise, we don't need to sequence every single transcript to get an idea of how important it is in, in a system. Um, and second of all, I think this decimal point, probably with the luminous sequencing, has now already moved uh, two orders of magnitude that way, if not further. And, and so this is going to get get better, that's not so much the issue, but, but it's really important to know this number because then that lets you be quantitative. You know what you didn't sample, and, but what must have been out in the environment. And so uh, here's what Scott did with the data from that sample. Uh, I know you can't read that, but all the way down that list are 82 different genes that are known to be important uh, in, in, uh, in, in three elemental cycles, either phosphor cycling or nitrogen cycling or sulfur cycling. For each one of these, we know what proportion of the the total transcriptome it is, but now we also know, actually that says uh, transcripts per liter, we know how many copies of that particular type, in our case of a biogeochemically interesting gene, is present in, in these, um, this particular environment at the time that we sampled it. Um, Scott did two replicate samples and that's why you see those, those two uh, dots up there and it gives you some idea of, of the, um, again, the, the, the reproducibility for, uh, for two parallel samples. So this is just one of, of many samples. We have a microbial observatory project funded by NSF in this coastal site off of Georgia. And so we've been going monthly. We now are up to three years worth of monthly sites and we've collected material for metatranscriptomics. And so the idea is we, we have lots of good uh, associated environmental data because uh, we put our microbial observatory in the middle of an LTER site funded by NSF. And so, for example, this is showing you their nutrient data all through that time pe period when we're collecting our samples. There's a lot of other additional information that we can get. And then in the context of that rich environmental data, we can try to interpret the, the numbers of these different transcripts that, that we're seeing. Um, there's two lines on this and I wanted to tell you what they meant. Uh, this is our lower limit of detection. So that internal standard told us that if a, a certain type of transcript was not present in at least one million copies per liter, chances are we were not going to capture it in our library. Uh, and, and then this upper line here at five million, uh, we are uh, saying is defining a region of low statistical power. So. Anything in between these two lines, we can see it'll come up as a couple of transcripts, maybe three, maybe ten, something like that. So we know that they're there, but the numbers are so low that we don't have a lot of statistical power when we're doing our comparisons later along this time series. We just don't have enough of them. You'd need huge differences in order to be sure that it was actually a significant difference. Uh, and then anything above there is at least 15 million copies per liter, and those are going to be a lot easier to look at over time. Uh, more deeply that we can sequence, then the more we're going to move those two lines over toward me. And so it, it'll probably get better and better in terms of how much we can access in this transcriptome and how well we can do the statistical comparisons with it. And I wanted to give you a quick view of what this, uh, the, the data from this uh, uh, sample looks like. Over on the right here is, is our um, internal standard that we added and that gives you some idea of the coverage across that gene. Each one of these black lines is one of our reads. It also tells you something push that? Yeah. Um, about um, uh, this would be sequencing error rates. So we know they all had the same sequence when we added them, so it was about three out of uh, 1,000. This is a real gene. These are 1,800 reads that all bend as closest hits to a single proteoridopsin gene in a, in a marine bacterium, a SAR11 bacterium. And so you can also see how these are, are mapping all the way across that gene. And also uh, those different colors means that there's differences between that sequence and the consensus sequence, and that turns out to be about 90 seven per um, thousand. And so you can get an idea of, of the population variability um, it, within these um, gene bins and, and, and know actually uh, what's error and then, and then the fraction that, that actually must be real variability. Okay, so uh, last example uh, is the idea of using metatranscriptomics to sort of capture a view of, of metabolic processes that are operating in uh, natural microbial communities um, at, at a certain time and, and place without uh, having very much manipulation. And so this uh, was a project of Maria Villacosta, who's shown down here. Uh, she's a former postdoc in my lab, and the study was done uh, in the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean uh, for, uh, uh, on a, uh, as part of the Bermuda Atlantic time series. So this is a 
station that's been occupied uh, every month for about 30 years in an NSF-funded long-term project, and Maria got on the ship in April 2009. Um, her question of, of, of microbial metabolism had to do with DMSP, uh, which if you're not a marine scientist, you may never have heard of, but it's a, an abundant organic sulfur compound. It, it's produced by phytoplankton primarily as an osmolite. They produce high concentrations in their cell, leaks out into the environment, and then bacteria can degrade it. The reason it's so interesting, sort of from a global climate perspective, is that if it's degraded by one particular pathway, uh, DMS is formed that uh, it is readily exchanged to the atmosphere, and it is the single most uh, important natural source of uh, sulfur aerosols to the atmosphere. And the sulfur aerosols work, work as cloud condensation nuclei, and that sets the cloud cover over the Earth. And so, so DMS has been called an anti-greenhouse gas for that reason. So lots of interest in, in what bacteria are doing and how these different pathways are operating that could lead to DMS, or in some cases not. So Maria did an experiment. Um, she uh, collected seawater uh, from the Sargasso Sea. Uh, there, there are some controls she did nothing to, and then some uh, experimentally manipulated uh, 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 carboys in which she added uh, some uh, DMSP into the seawater. Um, natural concentrations of DMSP out here in this site were measured as 5 nanomolar, and so she bumped it up fivefold by an addition of DMSP. So we gave the bacteria plankton. 30 minutes to recognize that there was a higher concentration of this particular substrate and one that they should be used to seeing and then to see if they were going to change their transcription patterns and if there was something informative in that for us. And so um, after 30 minutes, she filtered out the cells and we got uh, sequencing done, um, about 300,000 um, sequences in each one. Uh, and then we, um, I, I gave a, a talk actually about two weeks ago, and I showed this slide, and there was an audible groan from the audience when it came up. And so I thought it was really funny. It's probably at the sixth time that this has been shown already in two days. Um, so, so we viewed it, in a sense, almost as an um, in silico two-color microarray. So, so she's, got, uh, she's got expressed uh, 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 genes on, uh, in two different conditions, and now we're going to throw them together. And what we're looking for is areas on this um, metabolic pathway where there's differential representation when these communities have DMSP as one of their major sources of carbon. So what kind of falls out at us as being overrepresented? And right down here is the propanoate pathway, and it was by far uh, the, the had the most differential expression. Um, and so here's propanoate or propionic acid in what was really neat is if we add a sulfur and two methyl groups, that's DMSP. And so Maria was able to capture the, the degradation by this mixed natural microbial community of this three carbon moiety of the DMSP that we added. So uh, this is the keg pathway. Anytime an enzyme uh, was over uh, represented, it's shown in gray. Uh, we added this part up here. It's not normally there, but in our case, we know that that three carbon moiety is coming from DMSP. That's where the enrichment in transcripts is coming from. And so by some mechanism or other, we know that it gets to something that looks like propanoate. And then um, if you track the highest number of transcripts as a uh, hypothesis for how that's actually being processed by the community, then um, it would look something like this. And so this is one idea of the major pathway of degradation for this three-carbon moiety of DMSP in this natural microbial community. Um, somewhat ironically, we've got a number of model organisms that, that we have in the lab and that we're trying to find out about these DMSP and the genes and their regulation. And um, unfortunately, they don't do that. Um, they actually use, it looks like a different pathway to metabolize that three carbon compound. There's another group in the UK that's doing something very similar. Ours is an alpha proteobacterium model organism. They have a gamma proteobacterium and theirs actually doesn't use that way either. It actually goes we think by that pathway. So not to say that these model organisms are not very important and informative, but it's really nice to ground truth them against, at least in this case, this particular natural community at this time. And it also looks like there's a real diversity of pathways that are operating here, as you would really expect in this community. And we may not even have a model organism that has that particular pathway. Um, so Maria's model predicts that 
the next step for this uh, influx of new carbon as DMSP should be TCA cycle when it comes out the other end of that. And it was the case that we also found that that was overrepresented also. So it was a nice logical connection. Uh, we think that that carbon is coming in here mostly as acetyl-CoA. And again, these are all the enzymes that were um, uh, enriched uh, in, in, in the, the uh, transcriptomes of the communities that were degrading DMSP. So Nikos is not yelling at me yet. Okay, <laughs> there he is. Um, so I do have a few minutes. I just want to mention uh, our, our new foray into using Illumina sequencing for these metatranscriptomes. I can tell you that we actually went into this because we were really frustrated by titanium sequencing. It wasn't working well, well with, our, with our, some of our little fragments. And so uh, we were kind of forced to go ahead and try it, and it's really been great for this particular type of approach. Uh, this is a new project that we have ongoing with a number of people um, here, down here at JGI. And Adam Rivers is a postdoc in my lab who's, who's heading it up on my end. Um, and so we have four different samples, uh, two treatments and two replicates of each one. And each one of those got an Illumina lane. And JGI did a 150 by two. So we're getting paired in reads going in from each side. Um, our first step, the, the library was sheared to a size that we thought would allow most of those 150s to overlap to the, to the point that we could assemble them. And so it turns out we did a pretty good job. We got about 110 million out of the 148 that actually assembled. Uh, we had another loss of some when we pulled out things that didn't look quite right or we didn't like that assembly very well. And then we had a big loss of sequences because we always get those ribosomal RNAs that are contaminating the messages. And so we had to pull all of those out. And in addition, we add those standards, so we have to pull all of those out. But we got down to 66 million sequences. And you hate to throw away, what is that, 80 million sequences of anything. But on the other hand, this library is the largest one uh, by two orders of magnitude that we have ever gotten from a microbial community. So it's really kind of exciting. Um, we have, I don't really have really any data to show you, so we got these just a couple weeks ago. But, uh, but we, uh, in, in my group, we've always sort of viewed metatranscriptomic data as, as, as something that has to be analyzed in an unassembled way. Uh, so these are uh, very low coverage libraries. Each one of these genes might just have a couple of, of fragments on them. And so we've mostly been doing gene counts and, and comparing gene stoichiometries. But JGI wanted to give it a try at assembling and, and sort of much to our surprise, it actually does assemble. Now, not uh, a lot of things don't assemble. There's a lot of single reads. But for the more abundant organisms and the more highly expressed genes on those, we can actually um, see uh, it, a transcript, for example, that lo looks like three genes uh, that are related to, uh, to methane oxidation, uh, contig length of, of almost 3 kb. Here's another one. Oh, and it, it looks, uh, uh, it, the closest hits to most of these um, uh, reads is uh, a beta proteobacteria, a marine uh, limnobacter that was isolated and sequenced from the Mediterranean Sea, and it's actually the same three genes in, in the same order in that genome sequence. Uh, another one, again, about 3 kb, and this is a methane monooxygenase. Um, in, a, in that case, there's a difference in gene order, but it looks like something that we found in nitrosococcus genome. And then the biggest one was um, we actually found an 8 kb contig, uh, 17 ribosomal proteins with a sec y at the end. And, and again, you can look through the genome sequences at, at the top hits and, and find that arrangement in a number of other genomes. So uh, we were thinking that we'd maybe get sort of longer fragments in the assembly so we could actually get a better blast. But what's really neat is that we're actually getting operons emerging from this mixed microbial community because of, the again, the depth of sequencing that we're getting. Um, so that's very cool. Okay. So I just wanted to uh, acknowledge our funding sources. We're really grateful to, for funding uh, from the Moore Foundation uh, and also the National Science Foundation and from um, sequencing opportunities from the Department of Energy, as Nikos alluded to. Um, this is Rachel Paretsky up here in the corner who did the uh, DOC transporter work. Uh, Maria Villacosta did the Sargasso C. This is Scott Gifford who uh, is using our, our, our transcript standards to get, to get quantitative biogeochemical data. And then Adam Rivers is, is involved in the, uh, our new project now with the JGI folks. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Questions? Uh, did you validate your copy number estimates using real-time PCR? Um, 
So it's not possible. I mean, and I understand that the point, and it's a very good one, um, that you should be able to um, use a proven technique to show that you're getting right, back yeah. the right amount. The problem is, if you look at the diversity of these genes, you can just, sorry, just pull that off. If you look at the diversity of the genes that we're pulling out that might map to one of these types, finding a primer set that would actually hit all of those is nearly impossible. And so I would almost turn it back and say that QPCR should look at these kinds of data and see if they're doing the right thing. I'm sure that's heretical. But, but really, it, it just shows you how difficult it is to actually design primers that are going to capture that kind of diversity. But you can run real-time PCR for your vector that you are using as control. Our standard. Yeah, your yes, standard. Yes, and we have totally done that. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, one, one concern about trying to be ultra quantitative with this kind of data is the possibility of bias in library creation and mm -hmm. amplification and that sort of thing. Yeah. Is there any way to get a sense of, of how much bias there is um, other than real-time PCR, I guess, if yeah. that's not possible? Um, well, uh, we are probably going a little crazy with this, but we've started our last project, we actually added six different standards and they're paired by size because we're concerned that there's a real bias against small pieces when those libraries are made. And, and it turns out there are and so we can compare what we're recovering on those standards. So two are big, two are medium and two are little and, and those top four match very well and the bottom ones are coming in way below. So yes, there are biases. and, and uh, at least it's consistent as, as far as we know and, and, and of course you'd worry that, that there would be some kind of systematic biological difference in, in, that, that you were overlooking because of that, but 